And, uh, and anyone who's homesick, they're probably watching tonight. God bless you. And uh, tonight we're going to be talking about the election principle. The election principle, which is chapter 11. Uh, it's a very short chapter. Um, not too much to it. But um, there's a lot of talk about election. <clears throat> and there's a, a lot of misunderstanding about election. I'm going to give you a website that you can go to. There's a, a really, really, really good article on election and chosen predestination. All of those things. It's called Why God Did Not Elect Calvinists. Okay? So if, I want you to write this down. www.douglashamp.com out of Casa, uh, Costa Mesa, California. And he wrote a, I got the paper here. He wrote a really, really uh, good paper on the word election and the word chosen in the Bible and what it means. And it doesn't mean what Calvin says it meant. There is nothing in the Bible that states chosen or elect in reference to sal salvation has nothing to do with salvation. And so um, when you look at the application of the Bible and you look at uh, the election principle, what is the definition of it? So let's look at that. The principle by which the interpretation of any verse or a group of verses is determined by considering its relation to the election involved in the purposes of God. Always remember that when you're interpreting the Bible, you have to also take into account its covenants. And there were several covenants in the Bible that were made in the Old Testament and even in the New Testament because of the word covenant. And the word uh, definition of election, according to Webster's Dictionary, is the word election means to choose out a choosing or a choice. And in theology, it refers to the selection of are giving preference to certain persons or nations relative to the purpose of God pertaining to time, uh, etc. <clears throat> now, the word election in its simplest meaning refers to the intention, process, and results of making a choice. That's what election means. So God did not elect some to go to hell and some to go to... To, to get saved. There's no personal election in the Bible. There's not one scripture that even affords that. And so, um, I'm sorry about all those Baptist people out there. You're wrong. Um, simple for the fact, fact is, is that you're not elected, that you had no choice in salvation, that you had no choice. God just willed it that you be saved and others be willed and go to hell. Well, if we take that kind of an interpretation on election, then we have to take a white out and white out John 3.16. We have to white out the word whosoever will. Because then if it's not, it should read something like this. For God so loved the elect that he gave his only begotten son that the elect would be saved and the rest would be damned to hell. It doesn't read that way. It says whosoever Amen? So we have to, when you read the Bible, especially when you're talking about hermeneutics and interpreting the Bible, you also have to take into consideration the covenants that God made throughout the Old Testament and New Testament. Now, I'll give you an example. <clears throat> In Malachi... Chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. We're going to look at that tonight. You probably read the scripture before. <clears throat> this, is, uh, this is God speaking, by the way. He said, I have loved you, saith the Lord, yet ye say, Wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother? Saith the Lord, yet I love Jacob, and I hated Esau. 
and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Now, reading that, it looks like there's a personal love-hate relationship with God. So how are we going to find the true meaning of this, of this word, Esau, uh, Jacob have I loved and Esau have I hated? How do we do that? What's the proper way of going back and interpreting the Bible? Remember, we've been teaching you about the first mention principle and all that. So now you have to go back and you have to look at something like Genesis 25, verses 19 to 34, and we're going to read those, those scriptures, so it might take a little while. <clears throat> and these are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son, Abraham begot Isaac, and you can just keep going when I finish the, the verse. And Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah to, to wife, the daughter of Bethuel, of the Syrian of the Pan, Pandanaram, the sister of Laban, the Syrian, Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord was entreated of him, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. And the children struggled together within her. She had twins. And she said, If it be so, why am I thus? And she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said unto her, Wait, 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 whoa, 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 whoa. Two nations are in your womb? Those are two babies. Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels, and the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. Keep going. And when her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. Let's stop right there for a moment. Now, how do we reconcile that scripture with John 3.16, for God so loved the world? We understand he means the inhabitants of the world, not the world itself with dirt and atmosphere and water and plants. That's not what he's talking about. He says, for God so loved the inhabitants of the world, people. So how do we reconcile that? And if we look at it, it almost looks like a contradiction because here God is saying, Esau have a... Esau, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. So how can that be if God loves the world and gave his only son that whosoever believes? Well, the answer is this. See, we, when we look at things, we look at things only from the here and now. Okay? God looks at things not only of the past, the present, but also the future. And God knows the two nations that were coming out of her womb. And he loved Jacob for what Jacob was going to represent and what was going to come out of Jacob. And he hated what was going to come out of Esau in the nation of, of Edom, I believe it was. So you see, it was two nations. It was the people that would turn against, that wouldn't want anything to do with God. They were pagan, paganistic. They would, they would actually kill some of the Jews. They would be enemies to the cross. They would be enemies to the Jews, rather. So it was two nations represented there. We, we don't have to go on with the other scriptures. But you see the difference? That's why it's so important to go back and read the first mentioned principle and find out what it was that was on God's heart. It was two nations. Now, we talked about this before. Does God have the power to hate? Yes, he does. We read that in Malachi uh, chapter 9, verse 15, a while back. Um, that... Uh, he says uh, to Israel, he says, I loved you and I love you no more. And I, I've, learned, I've come to hate you. So again, I'm paraphrasing that, of course, but that's the gist of the scripture. So again, God does have that. If he can be grieved, the Holy Spirit can be grieved. Well, if the Holy Spirit can be grieved, then he has emotion, he has feelings. If he, be, if he can become quenched, the Bible says quench not the Holy Spirit. So if he be, can be quenched, so some people agree, some people disagree, but I, I believe that he's a personal God. I believe that he can love who he loves and hates who he loves. So the word predestined doesn't mean that God has forced 
his choice on you. Or foreknowledge. That because God knew it before time that it forced you to make the decision. No, it didn't. Just because God knows something in the future doesn't mean that he makes you do it. That you're some kind of robot that's just going to come to him because he desired like a wind-up toy. It's going to wind you up and you have no choice in the matter. If that's the case, then God violated the very thing that he gave Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. That was free will. Amen? God gave that as a gift, free will. So if God gave free will and yet is predestined and elected each individual, then he could have just predestined Adam and Eve to not sin. And we wouldn't be in the mess we were in. And see, the people that, that end up in hell could turn their fingers against God and say, God, I had no choice in the matter. You predestined me to hell. And that's not just. You put me in hell. I don't, I, you didn't give me a chance. I was already predestined for that. And of course, the big thing is, is well, what about Judas Iscariot? Yeah, he was, he was, he was, God had foreknowledge or, or he was the son of perdition, the Bible says. Okay, and he was chosen for that out of God's foreknowledge because God knew that Judas would repent. But it didn't mean that God made him make that choice. In fact, I don't know any leader anywhere in a corporation, okay, that would take a thief and put him in charge of the money. I don't know any church that would make a thief, a, a known thief, okay, in the community was a known thief, okay, and put him in charge of church finances. But Jesus, Jesus did. He chose him. And he, he chose him. Why did he do that? To give every opportunity. But even so, God knew he wouldn't choose. Even so, God knew that. And so what happens is great minds try to figure out God and they try to become God. And you ain't ever going to do that, so don't even take a step in that direction. It will never happen. All right, so the election principle. I'm going to read you from uh, Douglas Hamp's uh, Calvinist um, paper that he wrote, and I'm just going to touch a few things. He says here, and I quote, the term elect and its derivatives, therefore, are not salvific in meaning but simply refer to persons or things that are chosen for a particular purpose, and that purpose has nothing to do with eternal life. Once the definition of the word is established biblically, the foundation of Calvinism will be undermined and will collapse, and arguing the tenets of tulip will become inapplicable. If you don't know what tulip is, look it up. The word elect means to choose or to select. In the Bible, there's elections of priests, there's elections of kings, there's election of disciples, but none of them, none of them was without the people making the choice. First of all, you have Saul, the king, right? Who chose Saul? Yeah, that's, that's true. But who else? The people, right? What was their complaint? They wanted a king like every other nation. They didn't, want to, they didn't want to have theocratic rule, meaning God ruling them, just themselves. They wanted a king. So God gave them a king. Right? Look how that turned out. If you've not read the Bible about Saul, that's why I, I'm very amazed at how many, young, how many Christians today don't read the Old Testament. And you should. You should read the Old Testament because there's so much truth in there. Um, remember when um, Saul 
rejected the word of the Lord. The Bible says that the Lord, he said, has also rejected you from being king anymore. But if he was chosen to be the king, and he was elected to be the king, he should still be the king. No. The biggest one I found with Christians is this, is that they say, well, once saved, always saved. Once you make that decision, you know, you're always saved. You'll never fall away. God knows you're in the palm of his hand, and they take all these scriptures out of context. Well, my first question is this, is then if salvation and election and predestination has nothing to do with your choice that you're saved whether you like it or not. Eventually you're just going to be saved. And that your salvation is eternal, secure. You don't have to worry about it. You're going to, you're going to make it no matter how you live, no matter what you do. Then my question is, is that why in Revelation did he say, if you do, I will blot your name out of the book of life? How can you blot someone's name out if they're eternally secure? I'm eternally secure. My name's in that book. Guess what? It should, should be there for all eternity. Why does he say, I'm going to blot your name out? I'm going to erase your name out of there. Good question, huh? So God's election of the Messiah and angels, there's the election of Jerusalem. I can give you all the scriptures, but I'm not going to. I want to let you go to the website and get these for yourself. There's an election of false gods and foolish things. The election of, of, of Israel, Israel was chosen, Israel was elected. Uh, the few are chosen. Many are called, but few are chosen. You know that scripture in Matthew. Who's he talking to? Huh? In Matthew 22, verse 14. Who's he talking to? <clears throat> huh? Don't be afraid. Who's he talking to? But many are called, but few are chosen. Who's he talking to? Huh? To us? Okay, so if I asked you, where do you get that from, from for us? How would, you, how would you prove your premise? Okay. Actually, he's rebuking the Pharisees. Who's he talking to? Okay, we're talking about hermeneutics. We're talking about interpreting the Bible. Uh, what, are the, what are the keys or what are the steps of interpreting the Bible? Give me, right, context. Give me five, five things that we, sh we should do when we're interpreting the Scriptures. Huh? What's that, Bob? Absolutely. When interpreting a passage, you have to ask those five questions. Who, what, when, where, and why? So the first question is, who is he talking to? Okay. This is an exercise for you to get used to knowing what I'm saying. Because it's no sense in going through this if you don't understand what the, the hermeneutics as far as how to interpret the Bible. Okay, let me ask you this question. Who was Matthew written to? Right. How do we know that? Because if you go to Matthew chapter 1, it tells you all the genealogy of the Messiah. Right? And if you go through all that, when, when you understand, now there are principles that we can learn from that. Like the Bible says, those things that were written aforetime were written for our learning, for our example. 
Well, those things that were written aforetime is not just the Old Testament. It's also the New Testament because most of the New Te Testament and, and the Old Testament was not canonized together back then. They didn't have a Bible like you have a Bible today. Okay. Now let me ask you this. When you look at the Bible, what is that made up of? Huh? Books? Words? Okay. What else? Especially the New Testament. Mm -hmm. What's the New Testament made up of? It's, there's books, but what, what is it specifically? Yeah, oh, absolutely. All inspired by God. But what is it? Yes, Rebecca. Say it again. They're letters. There's letters to the Corinthians. There's letters to the Romans. There's letters to the Philippian, uh, Phil, uh, the Philippian church, the, the uh, Colossian church. They're letters. And the letters are a, is, uh, they're addressed to someone. So when you're interpreting the Bible, you have to know that who the letter is addressed to in order to get the proper context and the culturalism of that particular verse. Like in, we've talked about this, Matthew 24. When Jesus talked about it, he says that in the end times, you know, even the very elect will be deceived. There's the word elect and chosen. Now, a lot of people think that that's Christians. But if you read the context there, that's during the time of the tribulation. We're not going to be here. And then he tells them, when you see the sun turn to, you know, to blood and the, the moon turn to blood and the sun get darkened, it says, flee into Judea. So is that telling us that we better buy an open-end ticket somewhere on a 747 and get ready if we, in case we have to flee to Judea? Well, then who was he talking to? So he's not talking to me. Right. So there are certain portions of Scripture where it's not directly talking to you, but it will help you to understand end times. It will help you to understand things in the Bible and things that we could apply for, like be ready, the application to be ready for Christ's return. But there are certain things in the Bible that are not meant for you. Did you know that? There are certain things in the Bible not meant for you. It's not meant for you to go get a goat, kill it, and pour its blood on an altar. Hello? It's not meant for you to keep the Sabbaths. Why? We're not Jewish, not living in the love, or what else? Jesus fulfilled it. He's our rest. He said that. He's, the, he's, the, he's our rest. Now, do we take a day to go and worship together? Yeah, the first day of the week, which was on a Jewish calendar Sunday. Which was the day of resurrection. And that's, what we, that's why we come together and we rejoice and we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ, not on Easter once a year, but every day. Every Sunday when we come together. So when we interpret the Bible, you have to interpret it in its cultural, contextual setting. You cannot um, make it personal if it's not directed to you personally. You can take principles and teachings from it and learn from it, but you cannot change the original intent of the letter. Okay, like 1 Peter. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 1. Let me show you what I'm talking about. <clears throat> and usually the people that don't study the Bible are the, are, the, are the ones that come against you. Well, the Bible's written for everybody. Okay, go kill your animal then. Now, 1 
First Peter chapter 1. Do you have the NLT version up there? I think you do, right? Give me the NLT version. I want to see what it says. Okay, here we go. This letter is from Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. I'm writing to God's chosen people who are living as foreigners in the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. But if you look in the Greek, it says, uh, let me read you uh, King James first. It says, Paul, uh, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, the word strangers comes from the Greek word dispora. The word dispora means those who were dispersed. Who were they? They were Jews. They were Jews. They were Jews that went to Babylon, and then when, when they were returning, many of those Jews stayed in Babylon. Only a few remnant came out of Babylon. The rest stayed there and grew there and grew their families there. But my point is this, okay? If you read the next verse, it says, Elect, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience, unto sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace be to you, peace, and be multiplied. He's talking there to the Jewish believers. This letter of Peter is a letter to Jewish believers. How do we know that? They were the elect. What else? See, there's a lot of anti-Semitism out there. There's a lot of people that hate Jews. Even Christian churches. They've replaced with, uh, with the, the word Israel. They replace it with the word church. They've, they've nullified Israel all completely. It's called replacement theology. And they've replaced Israel with the church. I believe it's anti-Semitic. It's rooted in that demonic prejudice. What other way do we know that Peter is writing to the Jews? I'm going to test your Bible knowledge now. How else can we know that? Okay, let me ask you a question. When, when Paul got frustrated with the Jews, right? He said, okay, you don't want to hear the truth? I'm turning to who? Who did he turn to to preach the gospel to? The Gentiles, right? And the Bible says that God called Paul to go, who was Jewish, to go to the Gentiles, and he called Peter to go to the the Jews. Peter was a fisherman. Paul was an aristocrat, if I could say that, in the Jewish faith. He was of, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, it says. Studied under Gamaliel, which was one of the highest learned professors, if you will, of, of his day. But yet God didn't take the educated Paul and send him to the Jew he sent him to the ignorant Gentile, and he, he, sent, he sent Peter, who knew very little of it, to the Jew. Why? Well, the scripture says, right, that Peter was, was sent to the, to the Jews. And that's how we know this letter is to the Jews. I believe it's in Galatians, I think, where it says something like that. To the diaspora, to the scattered, to the Jews. So he's writing this. Let's keep, let's keep looking at this, right? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to the abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto the live, living hope by the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Where, where do I want to go from there?
Where is it that it says, but you are a chosen generation? Okay, 2.9. Go to 2.9. Okay, look at this. Okay, go to verse 6. Wherefore also it, con it contained in the Scripture. Okay, now this is Second Peter, right? 2.6. As the Scriptures say, First Peter 2.6, what's up there? As the scriptures say, what scripture? Let me ask you that question. What scripture? The Old Testament. There was no canonized New Testament at this time when Peter wrote this. You follow me? Everybody following me? They didn't have a Bible like this with all the letters all together. There was no canonized scripture yet. So when he says, as scriptures say, he's referring to the Old Testament. I am placing a cornerstone in Jerusalem. Does that have anything to do with Gentiles? Chosen for great honor, and anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. Go to the next verse. Yes, you... Um, can you do me a favor? Switch that back to King James. I'm getting a little lost. Unto you, therefore, which believe, he is precious. But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders allowed, the same is made the head of the corner. The stone which the builders disallowed, that's Israel. Okay, go to the next verse. And a stone of stumbling. Paul said to the Jew, the preaching of the cross to the Jew was what? A stumbling block. To the Greek it was foolishness. But to us which are saved it is the power of God. So the stumbling was to the Jews. Being disobedient until they were appointed. Okay, next verse. Here we go, look at this. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Nowhere has the church been called a nation. The church is spiritual. So who's he talking to? Talking to the Jews. What other way can we prove that? He says, you are a chosen generation, a royal priest of the holy nation. <clears throat> How else can we prove that? It's to the Jews. Well, they were the chosen people, but how can we, that's good to say, but how do we prove that? What are we talking about? What's our lesson? What are we learning? How to interpret the Bible? What do we, what's one of the greatest tools of interpreting the Bible? Principle of first mention. Who said that? Mama Linda. <clears throat> okay, the principle of first mention. Has this been mentioned anywhere else? Yeah. Huh? No. Come on, somebody find it for me. Let's see, Exodus 40, 15. Can you put that up there for a minute? Exodus 40, 15. No. No. Isaiah 8, 14. Try that one. Nope. 
royal priesthood. Holy nation. I think it's in Exodus. Exodus 19.6. Now I'm just throwing this one out there for you. So. And you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. Look up chosen generation. No, the, that, we already know that one. Come on, I know it's here somewhere. Where is it? Let me get rid of these. It's in Exodus, I believe. It gives a fuller... Is it Exodus 33? Okay, let's look at that. Oh, wait a minute. Let me look at this. Hold on. Deuteronomy 10.16. Let's look at that. 10.15. I'm sorry. I have my glasses. Is that what it is? That what, hold on. Maybe I got the wrong one. Exodus 19.5. No, Exodus, Exodus 19.5. Yeah. Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all the people, for all the earth is mine. 1 Peter 2 says, You are a chosen generation a peculiar people, okay? This is in reference to Israel. So that's how we know that Peter is talking to the Jewish believers. These are not the unsaved Jews. Understand that now. They're not the unsaved Jews. These are the Messianic Jews that believe that Jesus is Messiah. So he's talking to the Jewish... When I say he's talking to the Jews, I'm not talking about the unsaved Jews. I'm talking about those who have accepted Christ, that they're Christians, okay? And he's calling them that you are a royal priesthood, a holy nation. That you're to show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So that's how you interpret the scriptures. In 1 Peter, and, and knowing how 1, 1 Peter, who 1 Peter is talking to, he's talking to the Jewish believers. Now, can we get principles and truths out of that? Yes. Can we apply them to our life? Yes. Because we are a chosen generation, but we're not a chosen generation because we're Gentiles and we're Christians. We're a chosen generation because we've been grafted in. We've been grafted in through uh, Christ, and now we are of the seed of Abraham through adoption. Okay? Now, again, not because of who we are. We were of the Gentile nations. We didn't seek after God. We were heathens. We were dogs. Salvation, when it first came, was not for the Gentile. Remember? The Gentile came to Jesus and he says, it's to the Jew first. I came to Israel. And then when Israel rejected him, then he opened the door for the Gentiles. We were, we were, because of their blindness, the Bible says, we were grafted in. Because of the Jews' blindness. Because God had put a blindness on them so that we could be grafted in. Amen? So again, when you read the Bible, when you're reading, 
uh, the principle of uh, first mention has to be also applied to when you're interpreting the Bible. I need to get my, my two papers. So the election principle is not election to salvation, but God chose. God chose Jacob over Esau. God chose Moses. God chose Aaron. God chose different leaders in the Bible. He chose David. He chose Joseph. All of the ones that he chose. Now that's why when God chooses somebody, okay, remember those that came against Moses? What happened to them? Some of them paid a heavy price. Why? Because when they were coming against Moses, they were actually coming against God because God called him. Follow what I'm saying? Now, that doesn't mean that if someone is teaching false doctrine that you, can't, you cannot um, correct them or bring to light what they're teaching. Because you hear this all the time. People say, oh, don't touch God's anointed. You know, he's God's anointed. Don't touch him. No, if, if they're preaching false doctrine, you have every right. Paul named names. Diotrephes caused him much harm. He named the person. When Peter was being two-faced, Paul went up to him and rebuked him right in front of everybody. Was Peter anointed? Was Peter called? Was he? So if he was called and Paul went up to him and confronted him because Remember when he was with the Jews, he'd eat with the Jews. Uh, when the Gentiles, he'd eat with the Gentiles. But when the Jews were around, he wouldn't eat with the Gentiles. He was being hypocritical. So Paul came and he corrected him. He said, no, you're, you're a hypocrite, what you're doing. He corrected him. So it doesn't mean you can't correct a leader if they're teaching false doctrine. Or you cannot mention a guy's name if he's, if he's preaching false doctrine. And... and, and that's what a lot of people do today, and they just say, so what happens is, is that people keep going on in error. So again, when you're interpreting the Bible, make sure you're interpreting it correctly. You're asking the questions, who, what, when, where, why. Okay? When, it, when it comes to the election principle, know what covenant they're talking about. Know when God says they were elect. Who was elect? When were they elect? You know, uh, Going back to Matthew 24 again. When you read that, if you read that, you say, well, he's got to be talking to the Jews because he's saying, when you see these things happen, flee to Judea. And where is Jesus coming back the second time? Huh? How do you know that? Huh? The same way, but not only the same way, the same place. The same Jesus as you see him go, so come in like manner. So where he left from, he's coming back. But that's New Testament. Is there anything in the Old Testament? Huh? I believe it's Zechariah. I believe it's Zechariah. Talks about him coming back again to Mount Demont Olives. Okay, put up Zechariah 14.4. And his feet shall what? In that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. There has to be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall be moved toward the north, and half of it shall be moved to the south. And what a glorious day that will be. His feet are going to touch the Mount of Olives. And we were up there, Linda and I were up there on the Mount of Olives, on the eastern gate, looking at the eastern gate that Jesus is going to walk through. You know, and I, get, I just get chills if I can say that word when I think about it. And we were standing in the very place that one day, whether we, you know, it's a 
100 years from now or 10 years from now or 5 years from now, we're standing on the mountain that's going to cleave in two from the very spot Jesus left. You know, he was up there somewhere, and that's where he ascended from. And you can imagine all the disciples, there was over 500 witnesses that were all there. They saw him go, and they said, this same Jesus, as you see him go, shall come in like manna. Right there. We were there on that mountain, and it's going to happen. So again, with the election principle, know that it's just a word that means chosen. It has nothing to do with salvation. Are we were predestined? Okay, the only thing we're predestined to is the image of Christ. To be changed as a Christian. But individualistic salvation that you, were, you had no choice in coming to Jesus. You, God, are, you, God just made you. You had no choice. A Christian. Yeah, but he didn't make you be a Christian. Yeah, he already knew it because he's God. He knows everything. What? No. Your soul is the breath of God. When he breathed into Adam, he became a living... Okay? So, um, in case you don't know the biology of it, your mommy and daddy made you. No, you were in a spirit floating around somewhere. No. Where'd you get that from? So your spirit, Jeanette, was, Jeanette was flying around somewhere? No, your, your spirit is not floating around somewhere. And God went, hey, Jeanette, get over here. We got a body for you now. Where is she now? Walmart. Get out of Walmart. No, no, no. What do you mean? That's different. You're talking about vocation. That's different. Right, but God didn't force me to be a pastor, and he still doesn't force me to be a pastor. I can walk away tomorrow. Okay. But it doesn't mean that, 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 that forces me to keep doing it. You follow what I'm saying? Even though he knows, it doesn't force me to make that decision. I'm called, but if I don't answer the call, was Judas called? He was called to serve, but God knew he wouldn't. So God's not playing games. God's not toying with us. We're not puppets. So your mommy and daddy made you, okay? And then God breathed the breath of life in you when you came out of your mother's womb. The devil, the, the, devil, the doctor gave you a slap, okay? It could have been a devil too. <laughs> and gave you a slap. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then the breath came out and, you know, they cut the umbilical cord. And... See, just because God knows the future doesn't mean that he dictates that future. God told, uh, was it, Joshua said, choose you this day whom you will serve. If God be God, serve him. If Baal or whatever God, serve them. So, but if he had no, if he, he had no choice, God says, no, you're going to serve me. Then why did he tell him to choose? Why did he tell Adam in the garden, of all the trees of the knowledge of you know, all the trees you can eat of, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, don't eat from that tree? Right. God gave you free will. 
So even though God knows what you're going to choose, doesn't force you to make that choice. Okay. So remember that about election, because some people get mi mixed up with that. They think, well, once saved, always saved, and, and no matter what I do, what I say, I'm going to go to heaven. You're, you're, you're going for a big surprise, believe me. Yes. Well, Israel too. Put up, put up Hosea nine fifteen. All their wickedness is in Gilgal, for there I hated them. Talk about Israel. For the wickedness of their doings, I will drive them out of my house. Uh oh. I will love them no more. All their princes are revolters. Well, they're God's chosen people, aren't they? How come now he says, I, I'll love them no more? Because of the wickedness of their doing. Because of the wickedness that they were doing. What did God say in his word? You forget me, I'll forget you. Why do we have this one-sided thing about God when he comes to his love and stuff like that? Yeah, he's, he's a God of love, but he's also a God of, of, of justice and righteousness and holiness. And if we think that election means that we're all set and we can go and live and do whatever we want, we got another thing coming. You know, I was talking to somebody the other day, and I told him, I says, you know, I, I personally, now let me clarify this before you all get big-eyed on me, okay? I personally believe you can't lose your salvation. Whoa. Okay? If I lose my keys, I don't do it on purpose. You can't lose your salvation, but you can turn away from Christ and walk back into the world and turn your back on Christ. The Bible says in Hebrews, to renew them to repentance is impossible because they trample the blood of Jesus under their feet. You can, if you decide that you don't want to be a Christian anymore, you want to go live in the world, you want to backslide, you want to be lukewarm, because that's what a backslider is, guess what? What does Jesus say he's going to do with you? He's going to welcome you into the kingdom? Give you, give you Portuguese sweet bread? What's he gonna What's he gonna do to you? He's gonna vomit you out of his mouth. Does that sound like it's something nice? No. But see, people have this false security. They have this false security in their thinking. Oh yeah, I can still I can still uh, do what I want and live the way I want and you know. Guess what? You know you can't. And it's going to be a sad day when the rapture happens and you're left behind because you thought something was so and it's not. And then you're in real trouble. Because now unless you have the mark, you can't eat, you can't drink, you can't get your Social Security money, you can't get your unemployment, you can't get your paycheck, nothing without that stamp on your forehead or your hand. The mark of the beast. And once you receive the mark, don't let any of those other lying, lying uh, evangelicals out there telling you that you can get the mark and still be saved. They're saying it. You know why they're saying it? Because they need money. They want money. So rightly interpret the Bible... Using these principles, we talked the first principle mentioned. We talked about the covenant. We talked about comparative. All of these things are, are tools to help you understand and interpret the Bible. So when you're reading something, and I told that to, to a friend of mine that I was talking to one day about the tribulation. 
<laughs> and we were discussing he's a post, he was a post-tribulationist. He's getting closer. Okay? And uh, because I'm showing him scripture, and I'm saying, listen, brother, this is what this says. This doesn't mean what you say it means. Okay? And I said, yeah, what you're doing is allegorizing the scripture, and then when you allegorize it, you can make it mean whatever you want it to mean. But when you take it from the grammatical, literal interpretation, guess what? Any other questions? Okay, let's close in prayer. Lord, thank you that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Thank you for our parents, Lord, that brought us into this world so that we could experience life, but not only this life, but we could experience eternal life, Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And Father, if we have him, we have eternal life. If we don't have him, we don't have life. And so, Father, I pray, Lord, that you would help us to be able to interpret the Bible correctly. That, Lord, we will use the historical, grammatical interpretation of Scripture, not fly off the handle with these, quote, flaky revelations and inserts of people thinking that they're interpreting the Bible with their own ways and their own thinking. Help us, Lord, that we don't do that either. But we compare Scripture with Scripture, interpreting Scripture with Scripture. and Help us to be good stewards and help us to study, to show ourselves approved unto you, a workman that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen.